that into Google and find out. Can I copyright my name? And it will tell you no. Okay. Yesterday I put out this video again, but I did it just along with another video. And this is to void mortgage via trademark and sue for mortgage lender fraud. So in this video, I show you shortly, not very complicated, the idea behind how to get rid of a mortgage. Now, I'm only reporting when I make these videos what is already on Google. So I'm not giving you the full process. I'm just showing you the laws, the definition, the legal definitions, and explaining to you the viability of the content that is already on Google. And by viability, I mean the viability is fucking potent. There is no mistake or error in its application. So every video here is actually pointing you to research the exact topics that you need to have a 100% kill rate and get out of debt. And I already explained what kind of debt is included in the application of smooth operational laws content that we are reporting on. But it is not my content. The federal government wrote all this. So consider it like a legal loophole where Congress has legislated and legislated for years and it created this little algorithm of how to best attack your debt obligations. Period. If you have a credit card, you can attack it the same way. If you have uh, a, a, a contract with somebody that's commercial, you can attack it the same way. Yes, it is the same. That means same shit, different toilet. Now, I also go into how to file a complaint against an attorney and get compensation. The reason why is because a lot of these attorneys lie to you, withhold information, do not clearly express things the way that they need to be. They only tell you what is procedurally correct. So they only are going to sit there and operate based on the data that they're given and how to apply it in a court, which is very important. But as we've seen time and time again, a lot of times these attorneys are human and they make mistakes or they might come into the situation without clean hands. Like they might think you're guilty even though they're representing you. They'll take your money and then they will sit there and give you a poor job. And if you know how to hold them to task, then you might be able to get the biggest bang for your buck. What is the difference between mediation and arbitration? Okay, I'm, I'm gonna put the video that I'm talking about at the bottom of the screen. That way you know exactly uh, what video I'm referring to. Well, mediation and arbitration, in there you will learn what the difference is between trying to resolve internally two parties, and also if they breach the contract, how to go and enforce your contract and what elements you need in order to enforce your contract. So obviously you're gonna need like an arbitration clause or mediation clause to enforce that. Foreign Sovereign Immunity Act and the Commercial Activities uh, Exception. Now I did a brief, um, like, you know, synopsis and reported based on, you know, what's available on Google. Every time you click the video, there will always be a website. Just remember that. It will always be referring to a law that has been written. So we're just looking at the laws that they already have all over Google. So I'm not inventing anything here. And in that, you start to realize how to handle a foreign sovereign or king or government or entity or state entity. And when they do business, you have now found the law to apply to waive them and their arguments of being liable. You can make a foreign liable. Then we talk about 42 U.S.C. 1983, which is basically talking about how to get your civil rights upheld when somebody violates under the color of law, when they deprive you of a constitutional right. 
And then Brady violations, which is the part two of 42 USC 1983, talks about things like malicious prosecution, withholding exculpatory evidence, which would be evidence that would allow for you to have been made innocent. Because sometimes they try to bottleneck information or say, well, that doesn't apply, or try to strike your information off the record because it would absolve you of whatever their political intent is. And then there's qualified immunity, which is talking about state actors and police actors when they commit certain acts under their discretion, how to hone in, navigate your brain into zooming in on that violation and contextualizing it into something that you can make a claim from. Now, secure party creditor versus secure creditor deals with What is the difference between the SPC process versus an actual legal standing? Okay, a lot of these secure party creditors, they say I filled out a UCC one or I did this or I did that and you guys know the spiel. And if you don't know the spiel, then you can go ahead and Google it. But it's a farce. (laughs) There's no such thing as a secure party creditor. If you can't show it in a legal manual, then how do you expect legal entities to not claim you think you're a sovereign citizen when you're making up these legal fictions of thought that have no viability in a courtroom. Then why is my UCC-1 rejected? It's going to tell you why your UCC-1 might get kicked out of the Secretary of State's office when you're actually trying to do UCC-1. What a UCC-1 is for? And things like that. Now, why your signature literally equals zero dollars worth of credit is because there's something called vapor money theory, which is that entire process where people say, hey, I signed on this document and it was a mortgage and they made the credit out of securing that deed, although functionally correct and they made the promissory note from that transaction. And yes, it might have been a credit. Okay, there was something called, again, vapor money theory, which is in courts, they are told to not address that factor. So there's a control against the courts, okay, to not address that factor. So you will not get remedy even if by, you know, a function, it should be correct. Okay, it has worked in the past. But they changed the they changed the playing field. So we're not. I'm not here to tell you that you're insane for trying to address what vapor money theory is and looking at modern money mechanics and all that kind of crap. And okay, well, this is how it's supposed to have been operating. I mean, that might be viable, but the courts can't address it. I know it's fucked up. So when you look at that video you are now going to be able to understand why and make a better argument so that you do not fail. I give you these topics so that you do not fail. We're talking about application viability. To argue fluid money theory, the fake money, no, I mean, giving me credit off my signature, that is called vapor money theory. You will fail. So let's get paid. Takings clause and government compensation. This is about the government... Okay, doing imminent domain on your intellectual property without giving you just compensation. Intellectual property is a property. So with that being said, you must know the Fifth Amendment's taking clause and how to get compensated under that doctrine. I mean, I mean that uh, constitutional provision. And you can. So this is a guide on what to be looking at as opposed to trying to apply some legal theory and making some nonsense argument. How to obtain court order in order to seize bonds, documents, assets, and collect three times damages? Yeah, that's right. You heard it. (laughs) That is exactly what that is telling you. Yes, the bonds that people talk about and all of those statements of accounts and all of those contracts, yes, you can seize it if it's causing a commercial payment, if you have a valid trademark. Because trademark is preclusory as a property and it causes other commercial transactions to be subject to your control of your mark. If they use your mark, then it becomes a misappropriation of your assets. It's theft. So that's exactly what that tells you. State, citizen, national, let's address it. Okay, so I go over travel.state.gov and I tell you, hey, you know what? 
You guys that are coming around saying, hey, I'm a state citizen national, I want to get this other passport. These are all the reasons and the actual <laughs> government website that tells you what applies, who can be a state national, and what doesn't apply, or US national, to be accurate, okay? That's what that does. So if you don't meet those criteria, as shown in that video, you're not getting that passport. You're not getting that leverage that you think you're supposed to get. How to set up an irrevocable trust. The irrevocable trust is the most important. But you have to properly know, even for taxation purposes, how to create an irrevocable trust and what your liabilities are. Because even though you might have an irrevocable trust, which is a trust in which the grantor no longer controls the trust, the trust is irrevocable. You, the grantor cannot revoke it. The grantor cannot amend the trust indenture. Even though you know that that separates you from the assets so that you can be in an own nothing control everything scenario, you're still fucking fucked if you don't know how to do the taxes because what they're gonna do is, is they're gonna see what you're doing on the market and use taxation as a political weapon. And they might be right. People need to stop acting like they don't have to pay taxes. Period. You do. If you're here on this turf and you're a U.S. citizen or your entity has an EIN, you must pay taxes unless it's a specific type of common law trust, which is only receiving certain assets and you still have to pay gift taxes and things like that. Okay, there are ways to get around it, but I'm not going to show you how to make a tax shelter, period, period, because the mere speaking of that will get me freaking raped by the United States fire spear. I said, yeah, well, maybe hopefully it, it doesn't hit the algorithm and jack me off. So I'm not going to show you how to make that fucking fire spear. Okay? All right. So now here's the deal. Um, uh, uh, okay, so the new Supreme Court case study that proves that trademark is king. Yeah, okay, it's called Allen v. Cooper. And then I go into exactly how the government is interpreting the matter now because trademark and other intellectual property have been cleared on exactly how you waive the state sovereign immunity. I'm not going to tell you how to go to make a fucking trademark and then sit there and not tell you how it applies off of a cursory search from Google. Remember again, this isn't legal advice. This is just me reporting. Those tools that I have there, they're found online. So I just talk about what's online that you could type into Google and pull it up. Okay, so Alan B. Cooper states that there must be two prongs that you must meet in order to waive state sovereign immunity. And if you can waive the state sovereign immunity, I ask, what the fuck is a bank? <laughs> a bank is way less than the state, which is why you can get rid of debt. Okay, with this process. Now, the two prongs are, that it must be willful, so you must send a cease and desist, and two, that means a cease and desist for trademark infringement, and two, you must, must prove that there is no adequate state remedy. Now, how you prove that? Well, if you tell the state, chill, or you tell the bank, chill, and those motherfuckers right there say, ah, uh, we're gonna ignore you, or they do ignore you, and they continue to use that trademark, then they did not operate within the law based on that cease and desist. So you prove willful, and you also prove, what you call it, the, uh, hold on, I got this water running. So you also prove that uh, the, the state, if it is the state that is not cease and desist, because if, if it's just a bank, you can just bypass that with uh, just the cease and desist. But if it's the state, that would be the second prong because they did willful by ignoring it when there's a waiver of sovereign immunity under Title 15, Section 1122, and you notified them. And then the non-adequate state remedy is because since they are the state and they didn't stop, then you don't get any relief. So the federal government has to step in. Now, offshore bank, okay? When I say offshore bank here, what I really mean is, listen, guys, you can have, you know, other banks 
in other countries. There are certain countries where the United States tries to talk to them, but they don't report to the United States because there's no tax treaty. Now, am I telling you to go there? No. Am I, t- I mean, you could just go to Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico, you're still going to pay a 4% tax rate right in the goddamn uh, <laughs> freaking uh, uh, in the Commonwealth, but you won't pay federal taxes. And it's in the IRC. And it's still a United States territory. You're not even foreign. Okay, so you might just want to look at that video and see what I put in there. Okay, now, when it comes to trustee trademark registration versus unregistered trademark, okay, maybe you do want to register your trademark. Well, if you're going to have a trust and the intellectual property known as trademark is supposed to be the, the asset of that trust in order to give you the smooth operational law type of standing as expressed in these videos, which is not the complete process. If you want to know about the complete process, hit me up. My link is in Messenger. None of this is illegal, okay? I'll put your ass in the trust, which is where you will learn OJT, which is on the job training, and I'll have you work with me and you'll, you know, learn how to do the do by protecting intellectual property, which you can as a trustee. There is no law illegal that makes it illegal for me to make a trust with somebody or or get them as a trustee and have them protect intellectual property within the trust to actually show them how they protect it so that they can get the remedies that are that these videos are alluding to. If you if you for one second think that it is illegal, don't come. But I know I've been there. Okay, I've had two cases where they try to prosecute me for practicing law without a license. And they can't because it's privileged information as trustees. It's different than me having an attorney-client relationship with somebody. So I'm not going to get too much into that, but there's ways to get about that. Okay, and then here's the last thing. Oh, oh, excuse me. Let me let, 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 here's the last thing on this topic of trustee trademark registration. All I do is show you in the United States Patent and Trademark Office exactly where it exists. The laws and rules within the USPTO in their manual on TMEP 803. And you can see what the criteria is. All I did was just go to the website and show you exactly where it sits so that you guys stop registering trademarks as an individual, go do it as a trustee, and get the proper results so that your trustee controls it. I mean, that your trust controls it. Then it's separate and legal distinct from your personal identity. As long as you have multiple trustees and you have separate beneficiaries and you don't stand to gain. It doesn't break the merger law. Now look. How to get the state to arbitrate and pay you with no escape? That is the operation of law video where I teach you how under Supreme Court statute and certain subsequent behavior that an individual can take when handling your trademark after the infringement, they may be bound to a contract. Because a lot of times we want them to be bound to an agreement as in the form of a licensing agreement. We need to control the traffic of all commercial transactions. I'm going to say that again. All commercial transactions. That includes somebody just getting paid as a subcontractor. They act as a third-party beneficiary. You can swipe them up and vacuum them up into a contract based on your ability to negotiate. And uh, that's the last video that I made, okay? Okay. The reason why, again, I don't make videos every day is because these are just highlights on public information so that you can research the right type of stuff. Is there a lot more? Yes, there's more. A lot more. But I mean, is it a lot, a lot more? Well, this is leading you in the right topics. It's just you need to master the topics. And there's a short way to master the topics. And the best way you're going to be able to master the topics legally without having to go to law school is, is you're going to need OJT. Period. You can get rid of your debts. Okay? If, if a crime is, is commercial in nature or somebody's standing to get, gain money on it, there's waiver of sovereign immunity. Under trademark. 
because it acts as a property recognized under the Constitution of the United States, even though it's intangible. And the thing about it is, is under the equal protections of the Constitution in the 14th Amendment, they have to address the suit, especially if it's in an irrevocable trust. And the irrevocable trust as an entity is a non-offending party. So if I do crimes within my trust, no, I'm not getting none of that remedy. But if my trust isn't the bad guy, I can get remedy. Not going to go into it too deep right now. You could probably see some eluding in the videos, but just look at the videos. You know what I mean? Like I say, man, this isn't legal advice. But now I get to put smooth operational law into context and what it does. Yes, it takes away debt. It literally takes away debt. All kinds of debt. It can even contaminate cases because of the fact that they're using stolen property to try to which they didn't have a warrant for, tried to affect the case, and it attacks them. And when it waives that sovereign immunity, they're personally liable. So it's a damned if you do, damned if you don't scenario. But the truth is, as long as you're not some fucking crazy psychopath criminal, and you're going to the courts to have them adjudicate the matter, then you're well within the social compact. Listen, the government cannot fuck them being mad at you using the law correctly. I didn't write this. That's why I put it on Google. I didn't write this. You didn't write this. They wrote this. They made this. They adjudicated these cases. That's why I always talk about Supreme Court case being important to the operation of law. Because the Supreme Court cases are going to contextualize what your argument is and its likelihood of success, which is damn important when you're bringing up a trademark type of situation or claim. You need to have a fucking high likelihood of success before you even go into a trademark case. I'm telling you. If not, you'll start seeing people say, well, we don't really have to apply that, nor did they make the argument, and they don't have to remedy a claim that wasn't made. Hit me up if you got any questions. This is your 2022 wake up, okay? I've only been doing this on YouTube for about a year because I said, you know what? Yeah. A lot of people are talking, 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 talking. But you can't research what they say for real. And half of them don't even know the fucking law. Half of them don't even have any cases for anything. They say, hey, I got a case dismissed. I, it exists. And you're like, show me. Or at least show me something that's public that alludes to the fact that you would have a likelihood of success. And you know what happens? They can't give it to you. And do you know what that's called? That's called lunacy. So I appreciate your time, okay? I hope now you know what smooth operational law does. It, all I do is report publicly accessible information that if you look at it and you pay attention to it and try to literally and truthfully understand the topic, you'll see that there is some sort of algorithmic path to getting your debt off. And I'm going to give you another thing. Under trademark infringement, Title 15, United States Code, Section 1117, you can get up to 2 million per infringing article. So learning it is a way to change your life with actual claims. <sighs> Man. Imagine if you had a Schedule 8 with your trust, which I'm going to do a video on that. Now, this is a Schedule A. Look at this. I'm going to open up right now. And you see where it says lawsuit judgments? And now you have in your trust a shit ton of judgments off of motherfuckers using your name, including state actors. You don't believe me? Here it goes. Hold on, guys. Oh, come on. Waiver of sovereign immunity by the United States. 
The United States, all agencies and instrumentalities thereof, and all individual firms, corporations, and persons acting for the United States with the authorization of the and consent, excuse me, of the United States, shall not be immune from suit in federal or state court by any person, including any governmental and non-governmental entity for any violation under this chapter. And then B talks about the states losing sovereign immunity and that they can't claim 11th Amendment immunity if they're operating in their official capacity, right? Okay, and then remedies, and a lot of the remedies are cool, but the destruction, hold on, the destruction infringing articles means bank statement, bye, loan, bye, have a good time, court case, bye, have a good fucking time, see your ass never, that's what that is, so I'm just saying, man, I mean, you know, (laughs) <laughs> you know, it, 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 injunctive relief is another. And actual damages, which is under that, and profits and costs, is where you get the money. And it falls under 1117. So, and then here's the cool thing about that little law, which is 15 U.S.C. 1122. It goes into all of the statutes in the remedy section and it tells you, this is what you can get. It's written there. This isn't a secret. This is on Cornell University. It's fucking, fucking written. Fucking written. You hear me? Written. So anytime somebody's saying, well, you need to go ahead and get a land patent with the blah, 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 blah. You know what you need to do? You need to go, okay, well, let me see something that's viable. Okay, well, let me let me research this a little bit. I di- Listen, I freaking dare you. Freaking dare you to go research this crap. Research what's on the videos. It's just pointing you in the right direction. Now, as far as the drafting is concerned, well, if you if if you need listen, if, if, listen, OJT. <laughs> Let me say it again. OJT on the job training. Do you see what I'm saying? And then you oh, how do I protect? Well, this is the asset that I'm sure. Okay, hey trustee. Well, what do we have to do for this accounting? Well, you need to go after that asset. Okay, okay. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, I'm a, let me t- let me show you this. Uh, thrrr, yeah, because we're trustees. That's why we can do that. It's privileged information. It's allowed and it's not practicing law because you're not his attorney. That's what you're not. You're just taking care of the trust's intellectual property. That's legal. And here's the other deal. FRCP 17A. Federal Rules of Civil Procedure 17A allows for a trustee of an express trust to have standing to sue as a real party in interest without enjoining the asshole whose benefit the suit is for. From memory. Didn't even screen. Didn't even go through the screen. So, I mean, it's 2022. Okay? It's 2022. It's not for everybody. But that's that. I always stick around. Anybody got any bad comments? Oh, well. Sorry. Anybody got any good comments? Come through. Just learn it. It's cool. I want y'all to have an outstanding day. Hit me up. Let me know. Post this video today. Post a couple more in the next couple of days. It's a new year. Okay? A new year. Yeah. Let's get off of this. All right, guys. Bye.